Well, hello. My name is Angel Wood, and this is Crime of the Truest Kind. Hello, Murder Faces. That is lifted directly from Metalocalypse in the honorable William Murderface. Thanks for being here. Episode 21. Thanks for sticking with me. Had some audio struggles that I am working out. We will get through it. So you're hearing my voice. That means I succeeded in completing this episode and I deliver it to you. Thanks to a few local publications here in Massachusetts who've written about the show. Dig Boston, the local alternative newspaper. I'm alternative, or I was. I dig you. Thanks to The Patch, the community publication. I like being a member of the community. That is important. And the Boston Business Journal. I also like business. I ask you for your ratings and reviews. Bump me up. Help more people find the show in searches. You can review on Apple Podcasts, Audible, CastBox, Podchaser and Stitcher, five stars, are my favorite. Thank you in advance. I will share them on the show. Also, in my ever-growing desire to shame these silly serial killers are sexy memes and shirts and merch and bullshit, I think I'm going to launch a new serial killers suck design or designs. You can get all the existing cool merch now on the website, crimeofthetruestkind.com slash shop. Uh, One of the things myself and fellow podcaster Gazella from Grizzly Books Podcast. I know many other people probably do this too, but I am aware of what she has been doing. So we are together single-handedly going to strike this down. We're not, but we're going to do our part. Serial killers are gross and bogus and disgusting and dirty and ugly and all of those things. Goes without saying, doesn't it? The I Heart True Crime design seems to be a favorite. My friend Lee, Lee Rock and Roll, as I will call him. Lee wore his at his gig this past weekend. I will share that picture I got, Lee. Thank you. Contribute to the coffee fund. That helps carry the show very much online. Crimeofthetruestkind.com. I have two brand new icons on the page. I will let you go there and see what they are for yourself. Okay, that's a lot of the business. Uh, And that, by the way, is lifted directly from True Crime Garage, a show that I still listen to and I still like very much, and who just celebrated their 500th episode. That is amazing. Congratulations to you. All right, on today's show, we will hear a promo for the Murderific podcast, hosted by Bernadette, a New Englander from the great state of Maine. I love Maine so much. So listen up for that. In this episode, I also speak to Emily Sweeney, a friend and journalist who writes for the Boston Globe. Emily published a story on the 25th anniversary of the subject of this case being murdered. We will talk about the updates that Emily has. Yes, care packs are coming. Yes, if you'd like me to research a story, email me. All that info at crimeofthetruestkind.com. All right, follow the show at Crime of the Truest Kind, Facebook, Instagram, at Truest Kind, Twitter, TikTok, and buy me a coffee. Thank you, thank you. Today, the most grim, gruesome, sad, confounding case in Boston's crime history, the unsolved murder of Karina Homer. I've done a lot of shows about Boston. Please go listen to the past episodes. It is full of Boston and Boston-isms and all the great things about Boston and all the jokes I make about Boston. The sports, the colleges, the bands, the people, the crime. The latter, Boston has a very rich history of. Boston Tea Party, Boston Massacre, Boston Strangler, a whitey bulger, crooked as fuck FBI office, corrupt cops, the Craigslist Killer, Baby Doe Bella Bond, Boston Marathon Bombing. And that's the short list, and some of which I will cover in future episodes. One of the many things I enjoy about doing this podcast is that I learn a lot about the region as well. 
Boston and Massachusetts in general are known for its puritanical past. Well, in its present. The Blue Laws. Across the Commonwealth, there are restrictions on business openings on Sundays and holidays. Those are enforced by the Attorney General's Fair Labor Division. Colonial restrictions turned into laws and forbade any manner of labor, business, or work on Sunday, except works of necessity and charity. Now, lots of states have similar laws to Massachusetts, but the Commonwealth was among the most restrictive. Then in 1983, after some maneuvering and political chiding, the state began to loosen its stranglehold on Sunday sales with the appeal of higher tax revenue. You know, dollar signs. In the early years, big retailers and labor groups weren't interested in making any changes. But back then in the 80s, they agreed to support Sunday openings, persuaded in part by estimates of $1.3 billion in additional sales, 15,000 new jobs, and the state would gain 22 to 44 million in additional taxes. Even still though, opposition was strong. A pastor with a truly terrific name, Reverend J. Grant Swank Jr., a spokesperson for the Lord's Day League of New England, which claimed some 2,000 members. And he said, we feel it's a desecration of God's law and an unthankful gesture to the deity. Other religious leaders scoffed at the evil desire for commercialism to infect their most solemn day. Most off-premises alcohol, which means any place where booze is meant to be consumed off-site, like liquor stores are the obvious example here. But if a state allows groceries and drugstores to sell booze, those are also off-premises establishments, which you do not see a lot of still in the state of Massachusetts. Those sales were not permitted on Sundays until 2004. Exceptions had been made for municipalities that were within the 10-mile radius of New Hampshire, or the Vermont border. Retailers in those areas grumbled hard about missing out on that money. There seemed to be some gray areas of the blue law. Since the law changed in 2004, off-premises sales are now allowed anywhere in the state with local approval after noon. Retail alcohol sales remain barred on Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Day, and Memorial Day. Massachusetts also has a day of rest statute that provides that all employees are entitled to one day off from work in seven calendar days. That no alcohol sales before noon on Sunday, this change was made possible in 2003, most surprisingly by our one-time governor, Mitt Romney, a practicing Mormon, whose beliefs include avoiding tobacco, caffeine, and alcohol. I will refrain from any additional Romney jokes here. The governor busted a 200-year puritanical tradition, allowing Massachusetts liquor stores to remain open seven days a week, year-round. Happy hours are illegal here. You cannot order a double. There still are dry towns, too. Alford, Chilmark, Dunstable, Gosnold, Holly, Montgomery, Mount Washington, Needham, and West Hampton. Now, there is a discrepancy as to where the name Blue Laws come from, but I choose to believe it's from the paper by which they were written on. The origins of the term Blue Laws originally applied to laws supposedly enacted by Puritans in 17th century Connecticut to regulate moral behavior, especially what people must or must not do on the Sabbath. This called for very harsh punishments to be applied to the offenders. Blue laws allegedly specified penalties for moral offenses, such as failure to attend church on the Sabbath, lying, swearing, and drunkenness. The playing of games, such as cards, dice, and shuffleboard in public, it mandated more severe punishments for crimes committed on the Sabbath, and regulated the sale and consumption of alcohol. Violators might be fined, be whipped, or forced to spend time in the stocks, have their bodies burned, or even received the death penalty. Although there are people who will tell you that these are largely exaggerations, but I find it plausible that they'll cut off your hand if they catch you drinking on a Sunday. The temperance movement, which began in the late 19th century, intended to regulate private conduct by banning the sale of cigarettes and alcohol, 
prohibiting amusements and unnecessary labor on Sundays, and provided for local censorship of arts and entertainment. You were to pray, go to church, pray, teetotal, and pray. Now, whether or not you can buy booze on a Sunday hasn't made anything better for the crime rate. According to a report in the Boston Herald, this is the most up-to-date info I could find at the time, the city's crime rate has plummeted by 23% in almost every category from homicides to rape, robberies, and break-ins. The latest year-over-year statistics by Boston police show homicide down 13% since last year at this time. And according to this, reported rape and attempted rape is down 31% compared to this time last year, when we were all in the throes of a deadly pandemic. Crime suffered. According to The Globe, Boston police recorded 57 homicides in 2020. That is up from a 20-year low of 37 in 2019. Now, I have always found the city of Boston to be a safe city. Now, I know this is going to come as a shock to you, but I haven't always made the right choices. I've been that drunken girl rolling out of the club after last call, and it had nothing to do with whether I could buy beer before or after noon on Sunday. Such puritanical leanings have done little in curbing the violence against women, nor has it ceased the practice of victim blaming. If something bad happens to a woman, it is her fault for doing exactly the same things that men do. Now, maybe this is a long way to go for this. But in the past few years alone, we have heard the tragic stories of women on and off the streets of Boston held against their will, assaulted, and some murdered. In 2012, Amy Lord was kidnapped in South Boston early on a Tuesday morning, broad daylight. Her abductor drove her around the city, forcing her to withdraw money from her bank account before he stabbed and strangled her to death. In January of 2019, Olivia Ambrose was out at the downtown bar Hennessy's when she went missing. It's a very highly populated area. According to WBZ-TV4, Olivia left Hennessy's in downtown Boston just after 11 p.m. Once friends and family hadn't heard from her, they went to her Jamaica Plain apartment where she was nowhere to be found. Once reported missing, police discovered she was on surveillance in the company of two unidentified men, one of whom forced her to ride the train back to his Charlestown apartment where he held her against her will for three days, where he sexually assaulted her and threatened her life. Olivia was eventually found through the use of her cell phone. She was located in the area of her captor's apartment. He is in custody, facing multiple kidnapping and rape charges. And I don't know why he hasn't gone to trial yet. I do think that what's best for Olivia is for everyone to leave her alone. We sounded the alarm just one month later when Jassy Correa, out celebrating her birthday downtown on a Saturday night, went missing. She was seen on a security camera getting into a car. They eventually located that car. She was found dead in the trunk of a red sedan owned by a Providence, Rhode Island man who had escaped to Delaware. A beautiful little girl was left without her mother. None of these stories are explainable. How could they be? Now, these two stories a month apart drove many of us to ask what safety measures are in place at clubs to not let women get picked up by strange men. Well, I still do ask that question and speak to all of you to continue with your buddy system or squad goals or whatever you call it. Don't let your friends wander off or disappear. And something I have learned in my years is to be aware of what's going on with other people around me and venue staff should be trained in this as well. Yes, we are responsible for our own agency, but women get attacked, they get followed, they get kidnapped and worse. And it's nearly 100% by a man. And I don't have time to break down society's shortcomings. How about I ask you just not to be a dick? And how about I ask you who are raising children to learn how to talk to them about these things. That's my only lesson. There are many, many more women who I could include on this list of women who've been hurt or worse in the city of Boston. And their stories should also be told, and I will. The most grim, most troubling, and still unsolved case is that of Karina Homer. 
Murder is confounding. It's unexplainable. Incomprehensible. What would possess one person to kill another? I don't know. I think most of us feel this way. Karina Homer's story wasn't about how she died, because she barely lived. It was about how she was found. I've been planning on covering her story for a long time. It has been on the top of my list for those who have most impacted me, one that troubles me. And her story is particularly sensitive because it's unsolved. Rogue sleuths can hinder an investigation far more quickly than helping solve one. June 22nd of this year marked 25 years since Karina was seen alive. She's been gone longer than she lived. I always remember her because June 22nd is my birthday. And it was the summer before I started college in Boston. I went to a college in the Back Bay neighborhood of Boston, minutes from the alley of the clubs where Karina was seen out celebrating that night. And today, 25 years later, we are no closer to learning who did this and why. I'll settle for the who. The why, I don't know that we'll ever know. The why seems far less important 25 years later. But we would like to know. Of course we would. But 25 years in, the likelihood that her case is cracked, it's very slim. June 22nd, 1996. The last time Karina Homer was seen alive. So little has been written about the 20-year-old woman who'd come to the States on her lottery winnings from a tiny industrial town in Sweden. Schillingaryd. That's her hometown. About a four-hour drive from Sweden's capital, Stockholm. Karina had wanderlust. She wanted to experience life outside of that town. Born in 1976, Karina was one of three girls. Karina was kind and loving and full of fun. After high school, she studied the hospitality industry at a two-year trade school. She would go on to work in the industry, mostly as a waitress in bars around Sweden. And then she set her sights on America. Hi, I'm Bernadette, the host from Murder Effect True Crime Podcast coming to you from the state of Maine, USA. We are a bi-weekly podcast and discuss stories from Maine, New England, and all over the world. Our stories focus on domestic abuse, mass murder, familicides, cults, serial killers, kidnappings, and lesser known cases. Murderific is easy to find on all podcast apps or go to murderific.com. Give Murderific a try. Remember, murder and horrific equals murderific. It started when she won the equivalent of $1,500 in her local lottery. And with that money, she decided she was going to America. In March of 1996, she flew to Boston. She was going to give this new role of au pair a go. She found herself in the upscale town of Dover, Massachusetts. Two years ago, WBUR, the radio station in Boston, marked the somber anniversary with a story about who Karina was. Her story became about how she died, not how she lived. Her death was so gruesome and so revolting that it made headlines across the world. But for so many people, the story came and went. It was a half a body in a dumpster. Back in 1996, after Karina died, then TV reporter Ted Wayman traveled to Sweden to meet with her family. Somebody had to tell her story. Karina's 20 years of life on this earth had been reduced to a torso in the trash. Garbage tossed at dawn. This had to be incredibly painful for a family to withstand. She had been dehumanized, the Swedish nanny, the torso. But she was just a great kid always. Speaking about her to an American reporter had to be painful. No one would blame them if they felt resentment for sending their perfect daughter to America only to have her return mutilated. Remember, they only got part of their daughter. We couldn't even fix that for them. We could not even give the Homer family all 
of their daughter. Karina's dad and sister said that she had been a good student. When she was eight, she joined a troop similar to our Girl Scouts. She had a love for animals and an eye for adventure. Those lottery winnings opened the door for her to travel to the U.S. Being an au pair gave opportunity to travel, to have housing, and to earn a little money while she was at it. She reached out to an agency that dealt in stateside placements. We later learned that Karina came to America through an unlicensed agency, who, back in 1996, had twice been convicted and fined in Sweden for operating without a permit. So when Karina was killed, these so-called legitimate agencies had no record of her. Karina touched down in a condo on Tinsdale Drive in Dover, a well-to-do town 20 miles from Boston, There, she cared for the two small children of Frank Rapp and Susan Nitcher. He was a commercial photographer and she an artist. It was a job that came with a lot more housework than she anticipated. In fact, Karina complained about it in letters home. Her sister Johanna said Karina was planning on returning home at the end of the summer. And reportedly, she had a secret to reveal. In her writings, she said something terrible had happened. No one knew what, an ominous message. No one has come forward to share what that terrible thing could have been. And Karina's family and friends were stuck in a sort of purgatory of unknowing. What did she mean? What kind of horrible thing had happened? And why didn't she tell them? On weekends, Karina got a break from the toil of nannying and split to the loft the family had in South Boston, which also doubled as Frank's photography studio. That is a very nice perk. I'm not sure what her salary was, but a free weekend city pad was no joke. Her last evening that June night was in celebration of the summer solstice, a beloved holiday in Sweden and the longest day of the year. At the time of this report in 2019, the question was asked, where does the case stand now? The Boston Police Department has four archive boxes full of her things that they say they have looked at over and over. Reportedly, they go through the contents in case they've missed something, but still, there's nothing. Hers was a gruesome identifier, the girl in the dumpster, half a nanny. Karina's death and chosen profession of the moment was cruelly mocked on, of all places, the game show Jeopardy. Boston cops were baffled by the murder of Karina Homer, a Swede working at this French name type of domestic. What is an au pair? Karina's story is one of intrigue and has been covered over and over by blogs and news publications and lots of podcasts. Some do a good job, others not so great. In fact, I've seen the wrong picture posted of Karina. It's somebody completely different. She's been called everything from Swedish nanny to girl in the dumpster. True crime is like everything else. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of shit. This year, year 25, Detectives Gary Mitchell and Charles Daniels, wait a second, Charlie Daniels, from the Boston Police Department's Unsolved Homicide Unit, are the lead investigators working on the case, and they're looking for any information that could help in the mystery. Journalist Emily Sweeney spoke to the detectives about what, if anything, has changed for her piece published in the Boston Globe for the 25th anniversary. I will speak to Emily later in this episode for her update. We are always looking for little bits and pieces of the puzzle, Detective Mitchell said. Any little piece. There was a lot of conjecture over the years about who she may have been with in the early morning hours of June 22nd and who she might have left with. And none of that went anywhere. There was the man from Andover, a town 25 miles north of Boylston Place, where Zanzibar was in the alley. Herb Witten in his big white Pyrenees. He'd drive into the city on weekends, often dressed in Superman t-shirts. He, and the dog, Yeah, some people thought it was a little weird. Was he a suspect? 
Police wanted to talk to him about what their interaction was that morning at the alley. And when I refer to the alley, I'm not talking about the traditional dusty, dirty, dingy, dark alley. The alley was actually sort of a large courtyard among all of these clubs in the city of Boston. After last call, on say a Saturday night, it was like cockroaches when you turn the light on. Everybody just kind of burst out of the clubs were hanging out in this alleyway, in this sort of foyer. Boston police wanted to question anyone who may have had contact with her or have any information that could lead them to what may have happened. Witten told police that he took his dog into the city for the attention he got from women, but that he knew nothing about Karina. He also had a good alibi. He'd gotten pulled over for speeding on his way home to Andover that night. Given the timing of the ticket, police concluded that it didn't seem possible he would have already abducted, killed, and dismembered Karina and dumped her remains off on Boylston Street. That's, of course, unless he had Karina in the vehicle at the time of the traffic stop. None of that was determined, and Herb Witten was ruled out as a suspect in Karina's death. And there is nothing he will add to this case. He too died brutally, his death by suicide, less than a year after Karina was found. He had struggled with mental illness for years, and friends believe the stress of being associated with Karina's murder became too much for him to bear. I don't know that Herb Witten was the last person in the alley to see her alive. I have a friend who worked at Zanzibar and was there that night and spoke of Karina knocking at the door after hours trying to get back in. Much of the staff at Zanzibar were aware of Karina. She had been there many times. And one would expect they were all questioned in this case. Of course, the family she worked for in Dover were questioned. They had spent the weekend with their children, gone to the movies, had dinner with relatives. What was odd is that the day after Karina's body was discovered, there was an actual dumpster fire at the family's condo in that complex in Dover. The timing could not be any more bizarre. What burned and why? Don't know. Police did take ashes from the trash for analysis, but there was no evidence of anything related to Karina in those remnants. I think someone very clearly dropped a dime on John Zawiz. He's the leader of the industrial slash performance art rock band Sleep Chamber. Women of Sodom always come to mind when I think of his band and this brand of fetish rock, as I've seen it referred to as. This guy who I do not know, but I have heard of and his band, they are widely known for their spirited performances, bondage, dark imagery. Clearly they've made someone uncomfortable but lots of weird people don't kill anyone every day. He lived in the Fens. He had a dark rock band. He wore shiny pants. It's a little satanic panicky. Remember Damien Eccles? John Zuiz's story is not unlike that of Morbid, the death metal guy who was cyberbullied to near death over Elisa Lam. Watch this Cecil Hotel documentary on Netflix. It's all there. And John Zuiz was cleared. But like Frank Rabb, his name will forever be connected to Karina Homer's death. Now, I don't know anything about him other than he's a Boston rock guy and I get protective. I feel for him, really. People thought he was a little weird. We're all a little weird. And they were not suspects. Why is that? Because there were never any suspects. Karina was said to have been dating a cop. That cop, who still remains unidentified, by the way, was questioned about his relationship with Karina. The two men at Zanzibar, where he regularly worked, paid details. A week before her death, Karina and a friend, also a nanny, spent a night in the company of two police officers at one of their homes in West Roxbury. All three people remain unidentified, the two cops and the other nanny. Someone also reported seeing her around 3.30 or 4 a.m. that Saturday in front of a store 24 on Massachusetts Avenue in Haviland Street, near Berkeley School of Music. If that was an actual sighting of Karina, it is not far away from where she was eventually found. And there are reports that she was attending an after-hours party in the Fenway. There was the panhandler, as he was referred to in news reports, Juan Polo, 31 years old, who was questioned by investigators. 
He was seen singing and dancing with Karina shortly before she disappeared in the early hours of June 22nd. And Polo had a pretty long rap sheet of his own. 42 entries on an arrest record dating back to 1985, including charges that he took part in the gang rape of a Jamaica Plain woman on the floor of a gas station restroom. Charges that were later dismissed. He was questioned in the 1995 death of his former girlfriend, Evelyn Alvarez, whose body was found next to a dumpster behind the bowling alley in Lakeville, Mass. I tried to look into Evelyn's case, and it's as if she never existed. I'm really sorry about that. I may have found one single post about Evelyn Alvarez. I'm still searching. I may have located a relative. I'm not sure. Meanwhile, Polo was questioned and cleared in her murder. All of the men I just told you about were questioned in the death of Karina Holmer. None of them were ever considered a suspect. We know why. Because there were no suspects. The loft space Karina stayed at was at 327 A Street in South Boston. Artists who rented space there said Karina would often stay at the photography studio on weekends, where she'd meet up with friends before and after they hit the clubs. Neighbors reported they heard her arrive at the loft on Friday night, June 21st, before heading out for the night, but they never heard her come back. Something that was hard to miss because she often gave herself away in the early morning hours when she rolled in, usually with a bunch of friends, for the after-after, you know. There was no evidence Karina ever came back to the loft, and there's no evidence whether anyone followed her there, to her knowledge or otherwise. The family Karina nannied for had two young children, a boy who was in first grade and a daughter who was younger. Karina was described as gentle and caring by one of the neighbors in the Dover condo community the family lived in. Friday afternoon, Karina was picked up by a friend in Dover and was supposed to return Sunday night. Sometime on Sunday, a friend of Karina's, it's not clear who, called the family to report that she was missing. Frank Rapp drove to the Southeast studio to check whether she had been staying there. He found her things she'd packed for her weekend, but Karina was nowhere. By the time Karina's friends determined she was missing, the Boston Police Department had already started investigating what they found in that dumpster. It was, after all, part of Karina Homer. There is a report that Frank Rapp called the morgue asking if the body found at the dumpster could be hers, but it was before she was due back in Dover. Remember, the family was called by a friend of Karina's telling them she was missing. It's unclear to me when the connection was made between a missing Karina and the woman found in the dumpster on Ipswich Street. Though the address is listed as 1091 Boylston Street, it's right on the corner. And I have studied the map, and it's also very close to the Mass Pike. Very easy to dump a body, jump on the pike, and be far away from the city. Once the connection was made, the police wanted to talk to as many people as possible. A 21-year-old Swedish nanny who had been at Zanzibar that evening said Karina had left with an older man and they were going to an after-hours party. That same woman said the next time she saw Karina, it was to identify her body. Without the rest of her body and the lack of a crime scene that would hold the answers to many more of the questions, the investigation stalled hard Karina's own family were in the dark, may still be, about developments and efforts to solve her murder. And there are many discrepancies with her case. A year after her death, police said that she was last seen alone at 3 a.m. that Saturday morning. She was on the Boston Common between the Boylston and Park Street subway stops. Police believe she was making her way back to South Boston to the loft on A Street. It wasn't to take the tea, though. Couldn't have been. The subway doesn't run at 3 a.m., this sighting is unlikely, in my opinion. That's bunk, I say. Emily Sweeney writes for the Boston Globe. She wrote a piece marking the 25th anniversary of Karina Holmer's unsolved murder. It is the case that haunts Boston. I checked in with her to see what's new. Emily Sweeney, you have been with the Boston Globe since 2001. Dorchester native, I heard it. 
I heard it. It's there. I heard it. Yes, indeed. So you have followed a whole lot of the shit storm that is true crime in and around、mm-hmm. the Boston region. One of the most fascinating and、uh, confounding stories in the city of Boston and the region is the murder of Karina Homer in 1996. Here we are, 25 years later, and we are no closer to having any answers. To what happened to her? Yeah, it's it's pretty wild.、Um, you know, I it's crazy to think number one that 25 years has gone by. I, when I got the assignment to write the story, you know, about her unsolved murder,、uh, 25 years later, I couldn't believe the anniversary had already hit. You know, quarter century mark. It really resonated with me when it happened too, because I was about her age, and you know, I was going to Northeastern at the time. And so, for you know, a young girl to be going out to a nightclub and like never to come back, I think it resonated with a lot of people. There's never been like an official suspect named, but there there have been a lot of people of interest that have been interviewed by police. And I'm hoping publicity, like you're giving this case, and the, you know, the police are also hoping that maybe someone will come forward with with more information. There have been a lot of theories, and I've heard a lot of them, but there are probably more that I haven't heard that you're much more close to. I know there was there was the theory of the man from Andover who would drive into the city on the weekends with his dog dressed like Superman,、mm-hmm. and、uh, they did interview him, and he was ruled out due to getting a traffic t- getting a speeding ticket that night. You know his behavior was questionable. His name was Herb Witten, who subsequently died by suicide. I think a year or two after. There was the theory she worked for a photographer from the very nice town of Dover, Massachusetts, named、uh, Frank Rapp, who had some bizarre behavior. Can you talk about that? Well, yeah,、uh, Frank.、Uh, obviously, her employers immediately were, you know, of interest to police, and especially because,、uh, you know, when Karina wasn't watching the kids in Dover at their home, Frank Rapp and his wife. He had a rented a little studio loft type space in Selfie, and he allowed Karina to use it and like crash there. So often she would sleep at Frank's studio、uh, in Selfie, you know, after a night of clubbing or whatever, or you know, get together with friends before they went out. The night that she, well, the weekend that she disappeared, she had gone to the studio, and you know, with the intent obviously of returning, you know, she brought some of her stuff there. And、uh, neighbors said that they heard her come in, and obviously never, but she never came back. Frank was interviewed by police. I contacted him for the story, and I talked to him briefly by phone. Really? Did not really want to talk. Like we did talk briefly, and he, he pretty much just kept on saying, you know, he didn't want to comment and,、uh, you know, to respect his privacy. So I mean, it, it's it's very. Open-ended case.、Um, you know, there hasn't been any hot evidence that I'm aware of. Obviously, the、uh, you know I interviewed police, and they can't you know tell me everything that they have you know、mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. to jeopardize an investigation. Right. Yeah, Frank was definitely you know he was considered a person of interest, but again, never named you know, a suspect. You know, the fact that he had the studio space that he let Karina use, you know, was, was interesting. There's also a theory that circulated. For over all these years, that the police officer was involved. Have you heard that one? You must have heard that one through the years. Yeah, you know, a, a pa- like I had heard again, just like kind of like looking around, like, past media coverage and like online.、Uh, apparently, she had dated、uh, a couple people while she was here, you know, and、uh, one of them, again, I, I didn't verify this on my own,、mm-hmm. um, but I, apparently, one was a police officer. But again, no suspects have been. Was、named. that person? And I also ever... want to make clear too,、yeah. like Frank Rapp and like the police even told me right now they're not even saying person of interest. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people take that as being a suspect.、So. Right. Was this man, this cop, this person、um, that she dated, was that person ever identified? I never found, or, or at least so far in my research, I've never found a name associated with whomever this person was she may have been dating. Yeah, you know what? I I never came across a name either. When you spoke to the detectives, I know that、um, in your Boston Globe piece, 
because it's been it, it was officially 25 years on June 22nd. She went out on the 21st to celebrate the summer solstice, which is a very big holiday in her homeland of Sweden. And she had met a, a number of friends through the au pair community, as I understand it. And they were out celebrating at Zanzibar, which is a is a venue I think was still open when I came to Boston to go to school and I was hanging out in the city and I don't remember when it closed but I remember the alley very well it's a little creepy when you're down there to think about what happened to her the alley was a wicked popular spot I mean that's another thing that makes this case so strange is that it's not like she was in like this isolated area you know of the city Mm -hmm. um you know coming out of like the clubs right around there there's several clubs uh, there were at the time, and uh, there would have been a lot of people. Even the area of like Tremont Street, if you think like after like clubs get out, it's still pretty hopping. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. She was last seen Very much. that night around three in the morning. The last sighting that police told me she was by herself. Right. There's an unsolved homicide unit. When I read your piece, the unsolved homicide unit has how often do they reopen these cold cases? You know, we're, we're 25 years in. Has this been something that's been sitting for the last five or 10 years that there's a fresh set of eyes on this story now? Yeah, you know, anytime I talk to investigators, they always say like a case is never closed, so to speak, until it's solved. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, for, you know, any any unit, you know, the, the, the investigations are ongoing. You know, obviously things can slow down, you know, yeah. if people pass away, you know what I mean? Like leads stop coming in. The, the, the case has always been open. And again, with the anniversary, you know, this happens quite a bit, you know, they're just trying to, you know, any publicity, things do change over time. You know, the, the police were telling me, you know, people have a change of heart. You know, maybe somebody knew something that didn't feel comfortable with cooperating with police back then, but now they do now. Maybe they have a family of their own. Or maybe somebody did see or hear something that night and they didn't really put two and two together, you know, for some reason. I mean, this case did get so much publicity just because of how gruesome it was. Her body was cut in half. You don't really hear that Mm -hmm. ever happening. The lower part of her body was never found. I mean, it was just sheer chance that a person, I believe, like that was like going through a dumpster looking for cans Mm -hmm. came across her body, you know, right in the fence, Ipswich Street. It's hard to say where the crime even occurred. Police are still trying to, you know, figure that out as well. But yeah, it's a really bizarre case. And and I'm just hoping, you know, like I said before, with more publicity, maybe Mm something will come forward. When you think of it, all the details that you just laid out, I mean, if trash pickup for that dumpster was Monday morning and that whomever that person was collecting cans that day hadn't gone that day, they may never have located her, at least that Mm -hmm. part of her that they found. The lower portion of her body, they put that somewhere that was never mm-hmm. discovered. So she may forever, she could have just been forever a missing person. Now it's unsolved murder, one of Boston's most notorious at this point. What will it take, aside from like a deathbed confession, to maybe get some closure for this? You know, I mean, obviously a confession, you know, number one, that, yeah. that would be, you know... That would be great. Uh, But, you know, I think police are looking for anything to go on. You know, as far as like, you know, the evidence that they do have, obviously forensic technology has, Mm. you know, gotten better over the years. So if a suspect does come about or if there's like a person of interest, you know, maybe they can do DNA testing that they couldn't have done back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, I just want to make it clear, like right now there's the the police said wouldn't tell me any people of interest or, or suspects. Are, are there any um, resources and, available for for this? I, I, I'm not aware if there has been a reward set up ever. You know, um, I'm not aware of that. I haven't heard of any. Mm-hmm. Again, the police are just hoping people like out of the good of their hats will like contact, you know, the detective unit. You mm-hmm. know, if anybody remembers anything from that mm-hmm. night. Uh, it, it was great to see how many people, I, I posted the story on social media, you know, just yeah. trying to spread the word. And um, it was great to see, but it was wild to see how many people remembered or were like at the club or, you know what I mean? Like that night that it happened or had a girlfriend who was living in the, like, you know, the apartment building, 
where the body was found. And I was just like, whoa, like what a small world. You know what I mean? And that's what I have found so, so important. I've always been, you know, the stories that I've covered up until now are solved. You know, they know yeah. who the perpetrators are. These aren't the stories that I've done up until now are not, you know, they're not missing person stories. They are clear cut, solved. The perpetrator has been tried, convicted, and is in prison. And this story is one of those things where I wanted to be very careful with it for a couple of reasons, because it did have, like you, it did have an impact on me because that was the year that I came to Boston to go to school. A couple of months after, I was certainly much more naive in the fall of 1996. And I always felt completely safe walking around the city of Boston. And to this day, I still do. Taking late night cabs and grab the last train. You know, I, I've always felt completely safe in the city. There's an archive from the Globe that I read just yesterday doing some research where the person who wrote it, and I, I don't have their name at the moment, I can share it with you if you'd like, but um, they said they're pretty sure that this is not a season killer, so to speak, my words, not theirs, based on how they found her and the evidence that they do have, not all of which I'm sure we know, of course. So it could very well be that this person did this out of some sort of desperation, but took it to a very extreme level. It's fascinating. Yeah, it really is. It, and it's so scary to think of, you know, just like you said, like, you know, you think of Boston and being a safe city, and that part of the city is like, you know, so populated with yeah. people. Like how something like this could happen, it's just, it, it, it's mind blowing. You know what I mean? That a, a girl can be, you know, scooped up off the streets, cut in half, mm -hmm. and then her body's left like right near, like, and here and, we are. We still don't know who did it. And no one knows. Somebody knows. There was no, no scene. I would imagine that if someone is cut into very carefully, clearly this whomever did this did this very carefully and, and somehow either lucked out or knew exactly what they were doing, that has to be a grim scene. There's a great deal of cleanup. We've seen all of the horror movies about how absolutely macabre that scene must be. My brain just works overtime trying to put together the pieces of who could have, would have done this and who was lucky enough or, or smart enough or sinister enough to have gotten away with it. It's incredible to think, you know, I mean, it, even for like regular injuries and things, the amount of blood, like, you know, there was rumors of like, you know, could have been like a, a medical student or something or who mm -hmm. know how to do something like mm -hmm. this. And again, you know, it's still a question we're asking today, you know, five years later. What do you think in your experience up until now in, in your investigation and, you know, all of the people connected that you have spoken to, what are the things that we can do aside from just try to keep it top of mind for people? Is there anything that, you know, people like you and I can try to do to spread this word? Can we try to, I don't know, convince investigators to try to offer some kind of reward for more information? What can we do? Yeah, you know, the, the reward is a great idea. You know, I mean, that, that's really something that I'll, I'll definitely ask. I'm not sure if there ever was one. And another thing that the investigators just kept on reiterating to me when I'm talking on the phone was that, you know, sometimes like a little piece of information that doesn't even seem like relevant mm -hmm. can really make their investigation or, you know, could allow them to get a warrant. So, you know, if, again, if anybody was around that night, you know, of, uh, I believe it was June 21st, 1996, uh, and that weekend, so she went missing, she was reported missing the next day, the 22nd, and then the 23rd is when her body was found. So that whole weekend, if anybody saw, heard anything, maybe a friend told them something, anything like that, um, you know, no matter how small, definitely report it to police because they are, um, they are working on this hard. And uh, if they have, get anything new to go on, it could really be a game changer. Well, I, I'd really like to follow up with you, Emily, if you do find some additional information yeah. um, after this conversation, if there is anything, you know, that we can continue to offer just to try, like you said, if it's, if it's a matter of somebody who heard something through the grapevine and 25 years later, they have some sort of, you know, aha moment, this light bulb goes off and says, oh, maybe there's something to it because we've seen it time and time again, where 
people didn't really think that their information had any value at all. And surprisingly, it did. Mm -hmm. Totally. I'll I'll plan to follow up and I'll definitely let you know how this goes. Um, I'm really interested to see if there's something maybe we could try to do on a on a more public scale. I don't know how rewards work. I don't know. I think it's, you know, oftentimes I think it's just the kindness of a generous donor, maybe. If it's GoFundMes, I I, I really don't know, but I, I'd be certainly willing to try to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. Totally. I, I'll, I'll bring that up and I'll ask the uh, police how they usually handle that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. Because if there is like a fundraiser or something to start, I think that's a great idea. I'm in. I'm in because I think this is a this is a case of a, a young woman who came here with big dreams. And it's really unfair how yeah. those things ended for her. And her family was, you know, on the other side of the world and must have felt so helpless with what they learned about their 20-year-old daughter. Yeah. Well, it's incredible. It's unthinkable. And another interesting part of the the case, too, is uh, there were news reports where um, she was writing letters home to certain friends saying something terrible had happened and she wanted to get back home. We don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody out there does. Mm -hmm. You know, that could also be an important piece of this puzzle. I'm hoping that she had confided in somebody here that maybe all these years later they might be comfortable saying something. Maybe they know something that made them stay quiet for a long time. Maybe mm-hmm. they knew somebody that Karina was involved with. It, it's, it could be a number of things. This is a very, very interesting case and will continue to be until we try to get some kind of answers. And I'll, and I'll continue to try. And um, let me know if the investigators can offer any kind of insight on this or if they're willing to offer any additional insight on this. I would really like to try. Money talks, don't we know? It's true. Right? Yeah, no. Same. Well, I'll definitely let you know how it goes. I'll okay. be following up on this. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for, for having me. The, you know, the, when the story came out, I, my it's been on my mind for a really long time. You know, right around the anniversary, I realized like, oh my gosh, this is 25 years. Okay, well, let's talk about it. Um, I've mm-hmm. been sort of, I've been sort of dancing around doing this story for a number of weeks, and I, I just had it sort of on the back burner because of the nature of it. It's unsolved, and you could do damage to a case, right? I, and I don't, and I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, hinder a case. I want to help the case. So um, I thought that, you know, this was a good time to sort of move it up to the head of the line. Yeah. So let's start the conversation. Let's let's see if investigators will offer us a little bit more information. Well, I'll definitely keep you posted for sure. Well, thank you, Emily. Good to right. see you. Take care. Bye bye. All right. There are few things that we know. She was last seen in the early morning hours of Saturday, June 22nd. Karina was strangled with a rope or a cord. It is believed she had been held by her killer for a period of time. Her remains were found stuffed inside a garbage bag by a man collecting bottles and cans. He touched a trash bag, realized there was a person inside of it, and called police. It is believed she had not been there long. She was clean, and her makeup was removed. Police found a fingerprint on the bag, but it was incomplete. They never found a murder scene. This has hampered the investigation from day one. Karina's mutilated body was found in a dumpster on Sunday, June 23rd, cut at the waist and discarded like rubbish. Some kind of skill saw was likely used, aptly named, as it would require skill. This was done with impressive precision. The anatomy of the body would allow such a clean cut, but only if the person had knowledge of such things. She was reportedly cut below her ribs, above her pelvis, between two vertebrae. She had reportedly been cut in half in such a way that her spine was the only bone the killer had to cut through. Her lower body was not found. And her top torso almost wasn't. If that person collecting cans hadn't gone to that dumpster on Ipswich Street on that morning, it's possible Karina Homer would just be a missing person to this very day. Many theories abound as to why the killer or killers mutilated her. To cover up a sexual assault, to hide a pregnancy, ease of disposal, My gut goes with the latter. 
And I am not down with the multiple killer theory. You can roll out of anywhere with a heavy trash bag, but you cannot roll out of anywhere with a full-size woman's body in anything. This suggests that there was one killer, and the mutilation was mostly for ease of disposal. Reports related to this case suggest that this was not an active killer. It was not a serial killer. It wasn't somebody who had done it before. It's very likely that this was the only murder this person ever committed. That killer was out on the street early on a Sunday. One of the most serene moments in all of my years has been the early morning hours in downtown Boston. I worked a lot of brunch shifts on Dartmouth Street. And there is this beautiful stillness then. Something this murderer took full advantage of. I realize now that it was only a short walk from where Karina was found. Now, I worked there a few years after Karina was killed. But her death was felt by many of us who were around her age and were running around the city. Zanzibar had its liquor license suspended after Karina died. I don't think they ever recovered. The location became the Big Easy. I remember going there. And then the estate after that, a more bougie establishment. The alley at Boylston Place was eventually taken over by Emerson College. A seven-story residence hall would inhabit its space. Either way, the students were going to end up there. Karina was killed in 1996, long before face recognition, GPS, social media, 24-hour surveillance. Now, when someone goes missing, we have a far better chance of finding them. I did reach out to the Boston Police Media Office, who surprisingly did answer the phone. Thank you. The Attorney General's office has yet to respond to me. I wanted to know whether a reward was ever offered for information in Karina's death. The Boston Police Department does not have a history of doing rewards. That is left to a private group, members of the family, generous donors, or concerned citizens. I would like to set up a fund solely for the purpose of a reward in solving Karina Homer's death. It might sound like bullshit to you, but I believe it's possible. I know it is. 25 years later, I know that somebody knows something. We've got to smoke them out. Thank you for listening. Crime of the Truest Kind. I'm your host, Angel Wood. Everything online, crimeofthetruestkind.com. I also bought a new website, ihearttruecrime.com. I can't believe it was available. It goes directly to the show page. Please listen to the show. Subscribe. Rate and review. Five stars are my favorite. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Emily Sweeney of the Boston Globe, for joining me on today's show for an update. I will follow up with you. Thank you for your patience in getting this episode to see the light of day. It was a bit of a struggle. And thank you for all your messages. Please keep in touch. Until next time, lock your goddamn doors. <laughs>